Hello, this is the uh, third part of a second series of interviews with Comrade Nett. And this is the second part of the third part. <laughs> so uh, we have a lot to talk about and uh, we didn't have enough time. You know, we don't want to uh, extend this uh, discussion into uh, beyond 30, 40 minutes at a time. And that's why we're doing these in uh, various parts. Now, I'm uh, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld myself, activist who became an academic and uh, treated this subject uh, of revolutionary socialism in the political science department at the University de Quebec Montréal, where I obtained my doctorate. I'd like to introduce you to Comrade Nett here, who, as I've mentioned, is uh, both a theorist, organizer and activist of the uh, Jewish Bundes movement in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, should begin uh, by uh, recalling our memory of the five martyred comrades of May 29th, 2019, and uh, affirm that the uh, Jewish uh, Socialist Bund, you know, exists, survives, and uh, thrives. And we are discussing our various concepts, which are elaborating into a complete uh, political culture which is uh, beyond the uh, comprehension of many, uh, even on the left, who do not realize that there is still much to be thought about and merely rely upon cliches. So here we go. And uh, we have uh, two um, major topics today. Uh, what is the conception of the uh, Mashiach in Judaism as differentiated you know, from Christianity and Islam? And uh, we also want to know the nature of Judaism in terms of its um, abstract qualities and attributes. So Comrade Nett, uh, could you introduce uh, these two subjects to us, beginning with the uh, concept of the Mesh Mesh Mashiach, as we Mashiach, see. yeah. Um, yeah, um, so I mean, we already recapped uh, what is the Denmark and how is it not the, the anarchy, and what's Denmarkism and how is it not anarchism, and what is Denmark and how is it not anarchy? We touched briefly on the Messiah, but to go into full depth, um, this is a much more crisp elaboration. So there's essentially two types of Messiah, uh, Mashiach, Gentile, and Jewish. And I should preface this that while this is a Jewish stance, this is backed by years, centuries of understanding of what Mashiach is. Jesus was not the Messiah at all. And while there are several uh, offenses in the Quran that a Jewish mind rejects uh, referring to Jesus as the Messiah, we should clarify that the Christian concept of this is actually 10 times more offensive than what the Muslims think, because they 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 mix it with the Savior, which is no compatibility there um, with that notion. Gentile Messiahs, there are, there are basically essentially two kinds, unrevealed Messiahs and full Messiahs. So unrevealed Messiahs um, are Gentile Messiahs who are never seen as Messiahs pretty much in their lifetime, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X. Okay, Hampton. just slow down. We won't be able to understand you if you're just reading. Slow down when you're reading. Okay. Um, so unrevealed messiahs, and this is part of the Gentile concept, are messiahs that are not necessarily understood as messiah until they died because of what their achievements were when they were living. And the three uh, best that come to mind is Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Fred Hampton. Now, full messiahs this is still on the Gentile concept are messiahs who are recognized as messiahs during their lifetime, such as uh, uh, King, uh, uh, Cypr uh, Cypr Cypr how do you say it, uh, the, the Persian king, it's, uh, I have it pronounced. Messiris. Yeah, yeah, he was, he's referred to as a, a Mashiach in Isaiah chapter uh, 45, verse one. Hmm. So, you know, right away, even in scriptures, it's obvious that Mashiach is a lot different than what Jewish, but the Jewish concept is much different than Muslim or Christian on how they choose to. And one can, uh, conc that. can conclude that uh, Judaism is not ethnocentric in its conception of the Mashiach. No, no, it's not. There is a clarification of what a Jewish Messiah is, but that's also not as ethnic as people think, unless you're really talking about something from the line of Judah or something from the line of Joseph and maybe from Levi. But, but even then, you know, <laughs> I mean, Moses is often referred to in Hebrew songs as Mashiach, you know, and, you know, Maimonides, uh, the Rambam 
did consider him um, a king. So, you know, and that gets in the whole concept of what is a king versus what is a monarch. Mm. Um, a monarch is a, is a corruption of what a king is. Of course, you could make the argument that a king will always degenerate into that. That seems to be what the message of the book of Samuel was. Mm. Yes. Um, but like there's, um, so on the concept of Jewish messiahs, there's also failed messiahs such as uh, Simon Bar Kokhba. So if a, if a Jewish messiah fails in any capacity, that's not the messiah at all. So the the mandate for a Jewish Messiah is is technically more strict. It's more it's more broad than people think, but it's more strict in what you must do. There's certain achievements that have to happen for that person to be considered a Messiah. So, you know, you know, like I mentioned the David, you know, um, line, you know, uh, the line from Joseph, the line from uh, Levi, but you know, the Talmud does refer to things like you know the the the, uh, the house of Joseph. But it doesn't. But the reason why it doesn't point at the Samaritans, and this is because of the sectarianism due to the Judean versus the Samaritan, which was existed before the writing of the Talmud. That this this is actually evident in the scriptures itself. Mm. Yeah, and um, so you know the Buddhist view of the Messiah only cancels out the Christian and Muslim takes on the Messiah. It doesn't take away their beliefs. It just if we're going to be realistic. Um, both the Christian and the and the Muslims believe in a second coming of Jesus, um, which is ridiculous because there's no prophecy of the Messiah having to redo his work. That's the problem. Islam, with that. I think it's called the Mahdi, the Mahdi, the return of the uh, the Mahdi or the the coming of the Mahdi. You know, is is supposed to uh, coincide with the return of. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ uh, in uh, Islam, but I've seen uh, references in Islam that are uh, concerning, more concerning even, you know, in terms of there seems to be, you know, uh, a, a quoting from uh, Jeremiah in which it is claimed that the uh, the Jewish nation kills its prophets. Now, I think this is a reference, you know, to the uh, crucifixion of Jesus Christ and Christianity, which is claiming that the Jewish people we're in favor of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, who is actually Yahushua ben Yaakov. And uh, Islam seems to have picked this up as well. Have you noticed that? There's yeah, the which is funny because if you get into the Quran, the Quran rejects the idea that he was actually crucified at all. It, it does look like Islam was trying really hard from the start to bridge gaps between uh, Jewish and Christian, which is... yes. You can make better terms between the two. In fact, that's that's not only possible, that's encouraged, but to try to make Jewish into Christian or Christian into Jewish is not um is not something that, that can be done ultimately because I mean if you strip away the concept, for instance, of divinity, the Christian message is too obsessed with salvation, whereas the Jewish message is way more about take keeping oaths and, and, and respecting those oaths and never going back on oaths. Yes. So it's very, it's, it, and, it, and there are similarities between Christianity and Judaism that you don't see with Islam, actually. But, you know, those nuances, as interesting as they are, you know, there's a reason why they're, why, why Jewish and Christian, you know, um, tend to be adverse to each other. If we were to accept all these religions as valid, it could be said that Christian and Jewish is the exact opposite within that range. Mm. Exact opposite. Yes. Not always, but usually it, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, the conflict be between the um, the Judean and Samar uh, Samaritan um, concepts of you know um, where the temple is, whether it's upon Zion or whether it's upon um, I believe it's Mount Gezira, is is not really a valid question in terms of action today. Because if that stuff happens, it happens right now. If we were to talk about the third temple in the reference to Zion, as opposed to a second temple upon Gezira, the most logical conclusion would be that the old city if it could be cleansed out from like you know basically the profiteering that exists in there it would that would be the that would be the third temple especially because jerusalem is now bigger than the old city you know al quds mm. i do think al quds is a sacred word to me that that's a reference to the uh, third bait had mikdash upon zion um and there's there's a lot of stuff that's missing for instance everybody thinks of jerusalem when they think of zion but zion used to mean it's very hard to get your hands on info like this, but Zion used to mean the road of hills from Ethiopia all the way to Persia, which would include what's now Jerusalem. 
Uh-huh. About, you know? In effect, a, an ancient mountain range. Yes. Yes. You know, and I think it's because of the... I think that there's been a lot of forgetting about how much both Assyrian and African roots are in Judaism and the removal of the African and Assyrian roots in Judaism, I think has caused a lot of um, the deformity. And I'm not referring to Judaism as deformed. I, I'm saying that there are setbacks in Judaism because of the confusion, you know, historically. It doesn't invalidate anything like the Talmud or the Zohar, but it does mean that while there'd be more of a central doctrine with us, like say, as opposed to the Hindus, like the Hindus, if we were serious about Judaism, we could admit it's a bit more multiple choice. And I'm not talking about versus a conservative uh, reform or reconstruction. I'm talking about within the Orthodox. Like, um, for instance, Ashkenazim traditionally will not let you have rice on Pesach because that doesn't make sense to the mm -hmm. desert. But a lot of Sephardi will have rice because, okay, well, so what? There was no rice. The rice itself was not therefore unkosher for Pesach. That's still a disagreement which exists to this day. It's 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 not really an important disagreement, but, but it does show how much of a multiple choice that, you know, Judaism might be, you know? Um, and, I, and I do think that that's why there's invested interests from certain groups like Chabad to help make old sex disappear. Um, I'm trying to help uh, what was anciently referred to as the Kushafra survive, uh, otherwise known as the Afram Jews. That's the Jewish uh, people of the West African diaspora. Um, and they're interested in the Samaritan texts, a lot of them. Um, but, you know, the 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 third temple is this has to this this is the old, old city. You know, and I, I've, I've taken Ladino words, so that's Judo Spanish, to, to, to reference them. I mean, I may have to, like, check the accuracy, but I know the one for the Jewish court of Judea would be an accurate term. A Judea is a old Ladino term for um, uh, for the Jewish quarter of a, of, a, of a city. Like, there is actually Can you repeat places. that? Can you repeat that slowly? Judea. Uh, it, uh -huh. it means the Jewish quarter. It's a Judo Spanish. Uh, I believe there's a place in Spain that's still referred to this, but it's always meant the Jewish quarter. Uh -huh. Um, the words I have for this would be uh, Musleria for the Muslim quarter, uh, Nefsleria for the Christian quarter, um, uh, Armenaria for the for the Armenian quarter, and Judaria for the Jewish quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, this is not going to be a third temple without certain things being removed, such as the Israelis calling themselves Israeli. That's highly defamatory to anybody Jewish or Palestinian to 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 take up that term, mm -hmm. uh, and then. You know, as I said before, you know, not all trade, but the market within the old city doesn't belong there. I mean, you have all these beautiful Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and Armenian yes. places. Oh, good. So the old city is uh, the city with the, built within the walls that were erected by the uh, the uh, uh, Emir or Khalifa uh, Suleimani. And uh, in the entranceway, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the entranceway that is... Uh, um, in downtown uh, Jerusalem, is uh, has an inscription above the, uh, the the entrance, you know, which is um, a reference to uh, Abraham, and uh, not to Muhammad, but to Abraham by well, it, the, uh, it, it, it's almost, it's and, uh, kind of because you and I have talked about this. Uh, that's the Arabic word for Solomon. Yes, you know. Yes, and and he adopted that name as caliph or was named that as caliph uh, because you know the distinctions uh, between Judaism and Islam are not as great as that uh, conceived of by the uh, Christian theology uh, because Christianity itself wants to differentiate itself from Judaism and um, Islam it presumes you know that uh, it is superior to both uh, for unspecified reasons <laughs> oh, it, it always is unspecified you just got to trust that the the, the prophet was really speaking to God, referring to the prophet as Muhammad. Muhammad was a peacemaker, though I will say that about him, and he genuinely did, you know, want unity. I mean, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of setbacks within the Islamic text itself, but at the same time, there's different concepts provided in those texts that you don't find in the Christian text. You know, yes. this is probably why we even today have such a better time talking to typically Muslims because there's much more to relation there. As I had said before, 
um, the prototype to Judaism was uh, was was basically Jacob. The prototype to Christianity was actually Esau, and the prototype to Islam was Ishmael. Well, which one is the disgraced son? If you read the text, Esau. Uh, Esau's yeah. problematic. His children would be problematic, and they are the Christian. Yeah. So they are, in fact, an Abrahamic religion. But we have a perspective for that. In fact. The, I would say the mother of Christianity really is Wicca, and Wicca does uh, predate Gard, uh, 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 Gardner. A lot of people say it came from Gardner, but if you know about Gardner, he witnessed priestesses doing a ritual, and they believed in the maiden mother and crone. So Wicca does predate Gardner. Like it's it's funny that this one guy takes it, but I would say that Christianity, the father of Christianity, is is Judaism, but the mother is Wicca. And I would say that with Islam, the the father of Judaism is 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 uh, sorry, the father of Islam is Judaism, but the mother is Zoroaster Arianism. You know the the Persian monotheist religion. In fact, oh, yes, yes, yes. You'll notice we don't believe Satan is the devil. We don't believe that there's that, that there's an that, that that's an opposition the way that both the Christians. And the Muslims depict, well, where's that the devil? That's where that comes from. Uh, uh, it should be mentioned uh, that uh, the uh, Samaritans who live on Mount Gerizim, as it's pronounced, uh, had a second temple there. And uh, and that... Uh, second as in second from the, their first one, or they had a, uh, or you mean one separate from Zion? Oh... Well, um, I should also mention that the first video made of the Garrison uh, Garrison Museum, Samaritan Museum, which I made in uh, 2011, I believe, was uh, uh, on YouTube has more than 10,000 views on it. It became a uh, 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 primary source information and brought a lot more attention to the Samaritans. When I spoke to the uh, the son of the chief rabbi, when I came there next, you know, he mentioned uh, the importance of that video, and it's up on the uh, YouTube channel uh, right now as well. Um, so there are uh, vast uh, differences and tendencies within Judaism that we've mentioned, and uh, that uh, should be uh, uh, known about uh, to understand, you know, what the difference is between Zionism and Judaism, because its origins go back not only to the Protestant Reformation, but to uh, previous tendencies that fed into that current, and uh, I suppose helped to create uh, Protestantism in itself. Uh, Especially the Crusades, that seems to be the greatest progenitor to all of that. To Christianity. Yeah. Yes, yes. And we know that Christian Zionism predates Jewish Zionism and that it was uh, uh, mostly Protestant. Yes. In fact, it was uh, invented in 1835 by some British uh, Protestant who felt that the uh, place to send the Jewish people would be Palestine, on behalf of the British Empire, of course. So, <laughs> which uh, you know, you know, is incredible, you know, strategy on the part of the imperialists, you know, to develop a theory like that, that took like more than 100 years to develop, but nonetheless, you know, uh, the Anglo-Saxon, you know, worldview is uh, a long-term world domination strategy. It's not, you know, just some willy-nilly, you know, like a colonial project uh, that preceded it. This was uh, something that is, uh, has a long-term strategy and that is, involves the United States of America now and the whole Commonwealth, as it used to be called with Australia and Canada. So, uh, you know, this uh, mentality of Anglo-Saxon uh, shamanism supremacy is something that uh, has not died away, you know, it hasn't disappeared, you know, in despite of the impression, you know, propagated uh, that uh, this is, you know, old stuff. In fact, uh, the United States is sacrificing Europe at this moment, you know, in order to favor the domination of its own uh, alignment, you know, which is uh, basically the financial capital of London. So there's a certain irony to that. Yeah, <laughs> the colony, you know, giving sustenance, you know, to the imperial center. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll take care of that. Um, there's uh, another topic that you wanted to uh, dive into. Go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I would like to know more of uh, the details, by the way, at some point about Mount Giz uh, Gerizim. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
because when you say second temple, I'm not sure if you mean like they built the second temple or if you're referring to separate from Zion, but I'm interested. Yeah, Anything they built the second, that second temple that was destroyed by the returning uh, uh, Jewish uh, petty bourgeoisie from Babylon. And they came back and they destroyed it, the second temple, in order to build uh, their own temple in, in Al-Quds at Jerusalem uh, because they wanted to have a monopoly. You know, they wanted to dominate, you know, the, uh, the uh, what was it, the Israelite, you know, political culture at the time. You know, that's what the sectarianism, you know, that caused the uh, split between uh, Judea and Samaria. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a lot of good you can say about Ezra, but there's a lot to criticize as well. And for what it's worth, he was never considered a prophet. He was a scribe yeah. that was elected for certain purposes. But what I wanted to show was that this word here is essential, which should not be confused with this word, panentheism, as a not pantheism. And, and you know, like just showing you that I'm not referring to any of these things. I'm referring to panentheism, which is what Judaism is. Judaism is not monotheist. Uh, that's a big mistake that most of us are actually making consistently. But when you get into what Judaism describes as divine, while there are a lot of overlaps between us and the Muslims, there are there is a serious difference here. This is how you would describe how I would describe um, monotheism. You have the divine, which is separate from creation, whereas pantheism shows that there's division, but it's all within. So there's the divine and there's creation. So, which is not the same as pantheism. Pantheism would be all is one, whereas this is saying that technically all is stemming from within. So, you know, you have the, the creation is within the divine. That's mm -hmm. that's how pantheism works. Mm -hmm. And this is constantly like this is most noticeable in books like Job, in books like Ezekiel, um, the Psalms, and you can find allusions to it. Not not illusion, allusions to it in the Sefer Moshe, the, 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 the Torah scroll. Um, it takes a lot of research to, to find it, not because it should, but because we've kind of self-colonized the way we speak of God. In fact, as we both know, we don't even like to say that word, you know, because that word doesn't yes, describe... precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that word does not describe divinity. I, I like to say deity, which typically, which is saying uh, the, uh, deity, but replacing the D with the TH. Because I think that that's how you universally, to all these religions, describe the divine. But even then, I would rather not even say that because the divine is too, too big to be boxed in like that. That's very, no offense to our Muslim comrades. But well, the, Judaism the is, uh, it, it, fundamentally it, uh, it defines the, the deity as the unknown. So, you know, how you give a name or a description to the unknown? Uh, in Judaism, by definition, uh, creates a space, you know, which is the unknown, because uh, we cannot define ourselves um, as a deity as capable of creating you know, the universe. Therefore, uh, the, the the divine, you know, which which is capable of doing so, and which has done so, when in fact, uh, cannot be the same as us, and uh, and we cannot know what it is because we are not that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, basically, you know, you know, that's how you begin, you know, but in. Christianity, all of a sudden you have a God, you know, walking around, you know, like with a pretty face on, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, like that's so sort of reductionist. It's, 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 it seems a bit ridiculous compared to the Judaic conception, but uh, it is there's uh, something I wanted to add on to your, uh, to your interesting, you know, uh, mm -hmm. analysis, uh, because, you know, uh, in the 19th century, Marxism was based upon um, the scientific method, it's called the science, you know, Marxism is, you know, scientific method. Okay, what is this scientific method that I was referring to? Because in the 19th century, what was called the scientific method is not what became the scientific method uh, in the 20th century, you know, after the Einsteinian revolution of 1903, 1905, same year as the, uh, as the Soviet revolution with, uh, uh, and uh, so, um, you know, in the scientific method of the 19th century, you know, you have causality in which you have a train of events, you know, one of which influences the next to become the next, and the next engenders the following. And it's a linear conception, uh, which has, you know, political implications too. You know, political philosophy is called linear periodization, 
in which Marxism adopted, you know, as uh, an explanation of, uh, of the uh, historical materialism and development of feudalism, capitalism, socialism, uh, as projected by Marx. Now, this uh, conception had its cosmological equivalent, you know, because if there is cause-effect relationship, then uh, the universe, you know, is causing itself to 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 propagate itself, and uh, it was propagated previously by previous causes, you know, which produced, you know, the effect, which is what we are living in now, and there is a linear sort of, you know, connection between the two, between cause and effect, and uh, and uh, effect and cause. So that would mean, you know, that. The Marxists began to adopt a, a conception of cosmology, which was never written down, but it was conceived of as a uh, infinite proposition in time. Time was, you know, like very sort of, you know, absolute and rigorous, you know, and rigid. And leading uh, to periodization. Yeah, and leading to periodization. So it was, con you know, cosmology conceived of the universe as something that had an infinite beginning and an infinite end, that it had always existed that it always existed in the same form and would continue to exist in the same form, except that you began in thermodynamics to have the principle of entropy. Ah, okay, so the whole thing begins to break down at that point, in which, you know, all energy, you know, uh, degenerates into uh, heat and uh, there's no longer, you know, enough energy in the concentrated form to, uh, to provide for the... Uh, the suns and the life, you know, that we uh, know and enjoy today. So there's an inevitable decline to the universe itself. It's not something that continues in the same form. And the corollary to that, you know, like uh, evident, uh, you know, uh, law, which was absolute, is that, uh, you know, there, uh, if there was an end to the universe, then there maybe there was a beginning as well, that it was not something that, you know, uh, existed previously in the same form that existed now. So, this corresponds, you know, to the Judaic, you know, conception in Genesis of the creation of the universe. The first day there was, you know, a light. Light was created the first day, you know, which are the suns. It corresponds to the cosmology that I studied at university in my astronomy course. The second day, you know, there were the planets, you know, coalesced into rocks, you know, around the suns, you know, because there was a lot of dust hanging around, you know, that didn't get trapped in by the suns. Okay, so the second day, you know, there was the firmament, as it said as it's translated into Protestant English. <laughs> okay, so, you know, all of a sudden, you know, like Judaism seems to have a better theory of cosmology than Marxism did. <laughs> I appreciate the way that you're describing the book of Genesis because the biggest offense from, I would, I would hope, a religious, magical, or scientific mind is the notion of creation science as they, as the Christians purported it, because it, it's, it, it's, it's ignoring what I would say, what you what you just did is you went, you basically gave a proper alchemical explanation, which is what it is describing. It's not describing everything as literally as people think it is. You described what I would call the alchemical process of creation, which is what it is talking about. Um, we also have to remember that the, the first, it wasn't called that at the time, but the Big Bang comes straight from Kabbalah before scientists picked it up. Yeah, yeah. You know. yeah, right on. So we have a few minutes left, you know, before uh, our time expires. So I think we have about three minutes left, you know. So uh, uh, do you have a, a comment to make in conclusion? Yes. So the messianic age in Bundist terms should be that we should seek the true peace of Jerusalem and that it recognize Al Quds as this third temple. But on top of that, we have to know how to get there. And the, the, the answer is, is we have a concept in Judaism called Tikkun Olam. And I would uh, suggest people pay attention to Dr. Weisfeld's ad, uh, act, uh, revolutionary activism in um, Nablus, because I think that you started something that we should all be following after, this Tikkun Olam, seeking justice. Mm. Um, but it will come with the price of Zionists trying to clamp down on us. And, you know, they're already doing that. You know, but... Mm. You know? Oh yeah, tikkun olam. You know, even by an individual is so important. You know, because when I was there in Palestine, you know, uh, out on the streets at the demonstrations, resisting the uh, invasions of the military into the villages one after the other, well, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how many of me there were. <laughs> there, there were some other internationals. You know, but I was I was the only Jewish person there. 
but it doesn't matter, you know, because all that matters is that even one Jewish person would resist the Zionist military occupation of Palestine. Then you have, you know, the destruction of Zionism, you know, there and then in terms of that action, it demonstrates the fallacy of Zionism in and of itself. And your name is Abraham, so you can technically represent all three, although it might be difficult given, you know, your rocky history with Christian. I remember you telling me about the stuff you went through as a boy. Yeah, uh, yeah to be expected. You know, it didn't, it didn't, uh, I had no problem with that. You know, I was able to resist that quite well. You know, so uh, um, in, in conclusion, what would I uh, would like to uh, say is that, uh, you know, Buddhism is a uh, fourth position uh, theory which overcomes the, uh, the sectarianism, overcomes the absoluteness, overcomes the, uh, the formal logic of the previous theories of, of revolution. And this is what we must be able to do in order to develop the, uh, a theory of revolution that will work. Because you know, what has been tried previously has not corresponded to the uh, conditions existing, the existing conditions have not uh, allowed for the success, you know, of the socialist revolution in Europe. That did not allow for the isolated, you know, socialist revolution in, in uh, Russia either. And there were reasons why those revolutions, you know, were limited and why they limited themselves. And those are the things that we need to overcome. And in terms of uh, Europe and the first world, you know, we know that uh, the working class is not necessarily a revolutionary class and can be bought off you know, with the proceeds and stolen from imperialism and all that. But you know, in the international context, you know, it becomes another matter. You know, when the uh, working class in the first world you know, comes behind the third world revolution, when it becomes evident you know, that the international relations you know, are shifting. And we see that uh, the uh, prospect of a united international world you know, on an equal basis you know, offers a greater uh, validity, you know, to human life than what capitalism even is able to offer under imperialism. So I look forward, you know, to third world revolution, which is underway. Yes, yes, it is. Now we have Brazil changing. Uh, Iran is solid, you know, and, and resisting American pressure, you know, and uh, moving in to uh, an axis, not an axis, but a, a, a federation of the third world, you know, with Russia and China and Russia, which was seeking, you know, to become, you know, like a first world country, you know, European and all that, you know, like has to give up on that prospect now with the pipelines having been blown up. So the uh, umbilical cord, you know, with Europe is, is gone. So what we have is Russia aligning with the third world as it was originally before the Russian revolution. Interesting development. That that and China still has a proletariat. So if their governments are problematic, it's way more likely that those populations would overturn their governments than Europe or the United States or Canada. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But uh, China has uh, has a large communist party. I mean, it's uh, the proportion of the population that are, are in the Chinese communist party is, uh, it's not, uh, not great, but it's significant. I think it's about 5% of the population, 100 million people or so. So uh, interesting development possible there. In Russia, there's no organized you know, opposition yet. And, and, uh, but nonetheless, you know, the pressures of geopolitical life you know, are pr pressing, pressing uh, Russia and Putin to resist you know, the encroachments of NATO. So that's interesting in and of itself, even though it's not you know, a socialist government, the workers' government that's doing it. So something's happening. We'll see what's going to turn out, you know, to be the case, you know, but I think it's generally something that we un is unexpected and welcome. Yeah, so long as we realize that the nation state needs to be, we got to get rid of that concept. Yes. Even if you, I mean, I the state go all together, but if the state remains, at least don't let it be the nation state because that's it's that that's been a disaster. Yes. Okay, that's... That's all for now. We'll be back another time. Okay, bye for now. Never again. Never again, Carzans.